Hi folks, welcome to the channel. If you're new or returning subscriber, please remember to like our videos, provide comments to help us with continuous improvement to our content, share with friends and family, and most importantly, subscribe. Thank you. Here we go. Yeah. All right, so, so today I have um, Patrick, so Dr. Patrick um, Pradell. So hello, Patrick. Hello, host. Thank you for invi inviting me here. All right, no worry. So um, today I'm quite fortunate to have Patrick with us, who's going to share his, um, his learning journey with us. So what were the things that motivated him in becoming an industrial designer? And some of the instances that made them kind of sway towards a bit of the engineering side of things. So, uh, Patrick, if you don't mind, do you want to uh, give us like a background in terms of um, your learning journey, uh, where you started, where you've ended, and the things that inspired you to uh, pursue um, industrial design, but most importantly, um, research? Yeah, thank you, Oz. No, I think this is. Uh, I'm absolutely happy to provide you an overview. So, uh, well, I started, I mean, my journey to industrial design is started as a sudden decision. So after I, I, I finished my GSE and whatever, whatever equivalent there was in Italy uh, at that time, then I, I had to decide what to do next of my life. And, and after a couple of weeks of, of um, kind of like holiday, let's say, I started to think, what would what what I would really love to do, you know, and so I look at all the different kind of like uh, uh, degrees that were available at the time, and all the kind of different options, and then I came about industrial design, and I started to feel really really interested into the topic. I think it in fact it was really close to what my passion was were at the time. Um, and I felt also it was very exciting, you know, at the time I felt it was something new, something emerging. Um, at least I thought, I thought that without really knowing what it was about, <laughs> but, but I think there was a starting of the journey. So, and then, and then I made a decision there and I decided, okay, yeah, I want to do industrial design. And so I started to think, okay, so what is the best place where I can study industrial design within Italy? And, and and really at that time I had two options. One was to go to Milan uh, and, and and try to and try to get into into the Polytechnic of Milano, which was you know has a very strong reputation as a technical university in Italy. So so I think I was very much attracted by the reputation, but on the other side I was a little bit scared about the fact the, the I'm coming from a very small village, so moving to Milan meant moving to a big city with all you know, the issues related to living to a big city and the fact that I never ever experienced a big city before. Uh, uh, so, so that where so the second option was a small university in a, in a smaller city um, so during the summer. So before really enrolling in the into the program, I had to pass an exam. So emissions in Italy, so industrial design degrees in Italy. So the the, the um, the numbers of the places available in the industrial de design degrees in Italy are decided by the government. So there's oh. a fixed number of, uh, of places that are available. And those numbers are decided on a national level. So Milan can have 250 places, Naples can have 50, Florence is gonna have another 50, and Venice another 50 and whatever. And you need to do an exam in order to uh, uh, to get a position in those courses. Uh, and, to, and the exam is really a little bit like a driving license exam. Okay, so there is no portfolio requirement. You need to pass this kind of general, almost general purpose uh, driving license, license exam, which focuses on logic and whatever. So, so yeah, so, so, so starting studying for the exam and, and, and preparing for the exam and then starting visiting uh, different places. And at the end, I decided to, to go to Milan mostly because of the reputation of the, of the university. I felt, I felt it was, it, it would have been a great, a great opportunity to be able to, to go there because I felt that was, it was a really strong university with a really strong reputation and that would have benefited my career later on. 
And I need to say that that was a good choice. You know, re reputation, university reputation. So the reputation of a university matters to a certain extent. Um, so I started, I, I, I studied for the exam, then I went, I did the exam. I did reasonably well, so I got a place. Uh, which which was great, um, and then and then you know there was started my adventure really because I yet find in a very very short so the the I think the the exam was in August and the results they were given at the end of August and then basically the the the, the, the modules they were starting at the beginning of October so there was just a, a month window <laughs> to be able to kind of like. Find a play, uh, find an accommodation, and then move on. So that was a little bit, a little bit of an adventure. But by by May day, then I started, and and I immediately uh, loved uh, what I was learning and what I was doing. Um, so I I felt it really it was really close in in the things that I that I liked. So we became something that I was very much engaged, and I, and I spent a lot of time working on the on the project. Um, working on the projects and, and 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 really kind of try to to get the most out of the most out of the program uh sometimes doing also some extra activities if i had the time um and, and really try to understand what design was um and how to kind of like nurture my design skills and and, and prepare myself for 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 what i was going to do next and 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 really i think this is sound incredible given what i've done after M really at the time i really I, I, my idea was not to stay at un in universities at all you know my idea was to leave academia and, and actually work as a professional designer um so so yeah so how, how did i came to, to become an academic that's another journey <laughs> in the starts there and, and, yeah. and that's here really um so so but then you know I, I did my 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 undergraduate I graduated with a reasonably uh, good uh, good grade at least a grade that allowed me again to be able to enroll into a master because there was a threshold and you needed to have at least a 2 1 in order to be able to uh, get a place into a master and so I was able at that point so I, I got this kind of degree in industrial design which was mainly focused on a little bit of conceptual design, but it wasn't really strong into the product development side of things. Okay, so they were telling you, you know, about how, how to look at the aesthetics, how to create mood boards, how to do market research in order to inform your design activity, in order to learn about the things you were designing. But there was not as much focus, or, or, or at least I felt personally that it was a little bit of a, that I had a lack when it came to material and manufacturing processes. So I knew how to design a thing, but I didn't really know how to make that thing becoming a real product. Okay, I really didn't know that. And so I, I really felt when I came out from the uh, from the bachelor that I, that I didn't have that expertise. And at that time, they were starting a new program, a new master program in um, design engineering. At Polimi, and, and, and it was a joint master program between mechanical engineering, material engineering, and then the design school. So there were teachers coming from all these three schools, uh, and it was very much engineering uh, uh, focused to a, to a certain extent, you know, with a lot of technical content on, on product development specifically. So I started that, uh, and I was really happy to, to get a place there, started that, and that there was, um, there was a little bit uh, at the beginning there was a little bit of a i think of a shock uh, to say or cultural shock because i remember the first time we, we i started you know we, we had this kind of like mechanics course and we did some mechanics in the bachelor but it was very very light it was a very very light touch to mechanics and the first really lecture that i had in the master about mechanics there was this professor of mechanics who started uh, 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 writing equations about uh stresses and, and 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 how to calculate stresses and and it was all this kind of blackboard full of equations so he went in into the <laughs> into the class board and he started writing equations without really explaining what they were for uh, how we could use them and there was none of that and and so so it was a little bit of a cultural shock but but i managed uh, uh i managed to do it and i think at the at the end of the of the course the, also the professor he kind of recognized he, he recognized that 
that approach that he worked really well in an engineering degree. He didn't work at all in a design engineering degree because, you know, we, we weren't interested and, and we couldn't really appreciate the, um, the value behind, you know, a mathematical explanation of, of all the things that there are behind mechanics. But instead, we were much more interested into practical applications and how, how we can do that. And, and that was, and that I think for them, it was also a way to get feedback and then improve upon them, upon that feedback. But, so, so I did this kind of two years master in design engineering and I learned a lot about, you know, manufacturing processes, um, materials, um, advanced CAD. And then during this kind of um, master, I started to get very much interested into, into manufacturing processes and digital manufacturing processes. Um, and, and because, again, I think I had the kind of feeling that I wanted to learn more about manufacturing processes because I wanted to form my design background and being able to design things that they could be made and, and, and then sold. So that's why I wanted to learn more. And so that took me to take uh, a, master degree, a master thesis in in design for digital fabrication, uh, which was really kind of like not really sponsored, but it was in collaboration with a company who makes uh, laser cutting machines. And so what they wanted really they, they they wanted a master student and a master thesis to explore all the possibilities of all the things that could be designed with this new technology. So and then so I did I did my master I did my master thesis it went quite well, um, and and then I started it went quite well, but then I kind of like it was a little bit of an end, and so immediately after I I got a position sort of placement in a big uh, in a big company, um, who was making um, household uh, household appliances. So big big company was making mouse about and I was working in their IRD department. Uh, and that was an experience in itself. Uh, but then actually that experience wasn't as much rewarding, rewarding as I expected. So so during that experience, I kind of realized that actually I wanted to do something different. Um, and so I got the opportunity to I applied for a PhD. Again, we was in in a similar topic to the one of my master degree thesis. Um, so then I, I, I got this opportunity. I was very lucky to get to get a scholarship. Um, and again, I, I started to do a PhD. Um, and then the, and, and yes, and I think that was that was life changing. The PhD was possibly the most life changing thing I, I've done. Uh, on, on a different levels, you know, because they, I started really changing my mindset and focuses more on, focusing more on research rather than rather than in industrial design practice. But also because the the PhD was very international, so I started to kind of like uh, feeling myself uh, kind of like wanting to, to to broaden my horizons and having more of an international reach. Um, that was also quite significant. For, for what I've done later. Um, so the PhD went, I struggled, uh, was, was out of hard work uh, to kind of get everything done. Also, I, I, the PhD was funded by a company as well. So I had a very, very strong link with, with, with another company, with an, with an Italian company who was making machinery, uh, again, for laser cutting and, 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 and bending. Um, so I had the opportunity to kind of like Really work at a very very close contact with companies. Even though I was I was doing a PhD, I always had to spend a lot of time in, in a company. Uh, I, I met and, and and I work with people who were working in the company and were doing several activities from R and D to um, to commercial. So I got the kind of experience and I worked a little bit also as a um, as a freelance designer with with the clients of of the company who was funding my PhD. So at the time at the PhD, I also did a little bit of that. So I was also doing a little bit of consultancy uh, aside of kind of like my PhD. Um, and that was great. And yeah, the PhD was lots of work. It was not easy. It was not an easy journey. Uh, but I but I was able to kind of like 
kind of couldn't finish it and 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 and, and then it went okay, it went well. Um and then at that point really so I think there weren't that many opportunities as I thought. Okay, so specifically in Italy, I mean there were opportunities in fairness. There were there were few opportunities, but they but, but they were not very exciting to me. You know, I think at that point, possibly because of the PhD experience and, and everything, my kind of outreach became more in, more I think international. You know, so 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 the idea of staying in Italy was was okay, but but I was also you know very happy to to embark and do other things and, and, and to look broader my horizons and, and look outside. And I had the opportunity then, you know, I, I looked for job after uh, adverts and opportunities and and, and I had, uh, uh, I was invited for an interview in China for the University of Nottingham. And then I got a place after the interview and then I decided to move to China. And that's where really my academic career started to, to get a little bit more settled because then I started really working in academic, as an academic, I work there for a little bit less than four years. And then and then again, I was mainly involved in China. I was mainly involved in teaching. So I don't match much. Um, much. Uh, my, my workload was primarily on teaching because it was a new university. The, the, the course in product design and manufacture was, so when, when I was hired, the course hasn't yet started. So I saw the course really starting and, and and there was a lot of things that needed to be done we needed we needed to establish the prototyping lab so we had to i had to purchase the equipment for the prototyping lab i, I had to hire the technician um we had to look at you know all the labs work with, develop the design studios so there was a lot of establishing this new course in product design uh, and as well as teaching so i felt that on the research side i wasn't really there wasn't that much opportunity of, for committing enough time to be able to develop my my research side, and I think it was I was more and more interested in, in, in going back to reach the research and, and and devoting more time and, and develop further my my really my research background. And so I got an opportunity at Lafayette University uh, on on a project on design for additive manufacturing. I applied, got the position. Uh, so again, it was it, it was a little bit strange, you know, because I moved from being a lecturer, uh, a lecturer in China for the University of Nottingham, and then I moved to be a full time research associate. So it was it was a little bit of, of a step change, um, but I, I really loved my time as a research associate. I think that was one of the best time of my life. Life, I think, work work wise, because because I could focus on new research. You know, I, I was following one project and I could focus 100% of my time on research and, and, you know, sit on my desk and then not worry about anything else. And, and then, and that was, yeah, that was, that was, that was exciting. You know, that, that, that was wonderful from a certain point of view. But, uh, but research positions and, and working on research only uh, uh, contracts is very challenging. Because there is no job security at all, you know, everything, you know, if you get your job, you know, you get your job as long as uh, there is funding and when, when the funding run out and if you don't have another project, you know, coming after, then you're basically uh, unemployed. Mm. So that's why I decided to, to, to go back into academia. Um, and again, very lucky. I got a place as a lecturer um, at Lafbara. And and then yeah, this is where I am. Okay. Really. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. I mean, you've just saved me a lot of work. Uh, all right, cheers for that, Patrick. All right. So um, so let's talk about um the area that you 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 specialize in, which is um design for additive manufacturing, in particular, or the area of uh, design for uh, manufacturing. So, because um, this term tends to be used a lot, additive manufacturing, additive manufacturing. Um, can you give us a little bit of context into what that means? What is additive manufacturing? And how do you link design to the notion of additive manufacturing? Yeah. 
So I will try to to be as brief as I can. So additive manufacturing is basically building things, uh, uh, maybe not one piece at a time, but but be building things starting from little blocks of material and, and then building them uh, bottom to top, you know. Um, and and this, this way of making things is substantially different from the manufacturing technologies that we have developed before, you know. So, you know, casting, stamping, they all work by modifying a volume of material um, using either pressure or heat. Or you have CNC machining, all the CNC machining, sewing, cutting, and so on, that they take a block of material and they are removing material. So you either have manufacturing processes who are changing the shape of a volume or those who are removing material. Additive is a completely new way of thinking, if you wish, additive man uh, uh, manufacturing processes, because of because the principle is really completely different from the processes, uh, uh, from the other processes. You know. So you're adding materials bit by bit. And because of that, you have a completely different set of capabilities at your disposal. So the additive manufacturing processes, they can make things that would be very expensive or impossible with other manufacturing processes. And that's why where design comes in. because. If you really want to fully exploit these capabilities, you really want to fully exploit what additive manufacturing can, can give you and can make, then you need to be able to design those things. You need to be able to design the things that they can get the most out of additive manufacturing. And that way the design becomes you know, a key element uh, uh, and a key enabler, as they, as they say, to, to be able to fully capitalize on the opportunity that is new principle of manufacturing provides you. Okay, that's, uh, that's my explanation for this. Okay. All right. Cheers for that, Patrick. So in terms of um, design, designing for additive manufacturing, is there a set in defined workflow when it comes to the design rules relating to additive manufacturing? Well, I think there is a general workflow. You know, there is, there is a generic workflow that is very similar for different application and different manufacturing processes, different additive manufacturing processes. Um, and this general application, you know, it comes from CAD file, um, STL file, slicing, um, post-processing, well, not post-processing, uh, creation of the G-code, and then uh, 3D printing of the part. And then there will be post-processing operation at the end. So this is kind of like the very generic process. Um, now, this applies mostly to all additive manufacturing processes. You know, the difference that it comes in, it, it comes either at the beginning, so in the CAD, you know, how are you integrating the knowledge from the additive manufacturing process you're using? into your CAD and your design process. So the process that takes you to creating the final CAD file. And the and this workflow can change also when after you have your CAD file and then you're starting slicing and making the G code or whatever you need in order to drive your additive manufacturing process. Okay. So so it's generic, but either at the beginning before the CAD file and either after the CAD file, then you can add some elements that are specific to different manufacturing processes, you know, and potentially to even different applications. You know, if, if, if you have kind of like medical applications that they require personalization, then there might be elements of, you know, scanning and, and reverse engineering, the camming. Um, if you have applications that they require lightweight structures or um, components that they need to be um, optimized, you know, for a specific, uh, for weight reduction purposes or for specific mechanical properties, then you might have, to generate the CAD file, you might have a topology optimization or a generative design tool that 
creates that CAP file, and then you're going to to input into your um, into your part programming software. What is also called a slicer. Okay.